Hello, on behalf of Methodist United, I would like to welcome you to our annual Lenten season services. I'm Doris Ziemba, Chairman of Methodist United, and I'll be your host Wednesday evenings through Lent as we hear tonight the fourth message from our local clergy. For those who may be joining us for the first time, Methodist United is a team comprised from 10 local churches doing ministry in the greater Shemokin area. In addition to our Lenten services, we serve local communities and churches. We sponsor an annual lay academy, equipping the saints to do God's work. Our members and churches support Manna for Many, helping to feed the, our community in need. And in recent years, we have sponsored a playground ministry. If you would like to see Methodist United continue to serve our community and would like to support our ministries, you can send contributions to our treasure, Jeannie Crawl, at the below address. Tonight's message is brought to you by Pastor Beverly Petrovich, pastor of Treverton UMC and Irish Valley UMC, and comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 49 to 52. Grace and peace to all. Good evening and welcome. It's my honor to be here this evening to speak with you and, and be a part of your Lenten worship as we go into this, uh, pass through this time of preparation and remembering and just re-examining ourselves in all. Our scripture this evening comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, and it is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. The scripture reads this way. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. And this evening, I'm going to bounce around a little bit in the book of, uh, the chapter of 1 Corinthians, as Paul speaks to the church that is found itself in the midst of a Greek city. Greek philosophy at that point in time did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Their thoughts were that when you died, it was like escaping from a prison which would be called the body. The body would be the prison you would escape from and your soul would go out there somewhere else and just be. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead and this type of attitude worked its way into the church of Corinth. And people were beginning to get confused and a little unsteady on their feet. Not that they didn't have faith, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, they were confused. And yet this very thing that Christ teaches us, this very thing that happens, that Paul calls the great mystery, and that is Christ, life, death, and resurrection is the actual pivotal point of all our faith. It's a pivotal point of our belief. It is the pivotal point of who we are in Christ that we, like him, like in our baptism, we are immersed into the water, brought back out of the water as coming out of death, being resurrected, a new individual. Well, the Greeks did not believe this. Their philosophy was totally different, and the church was confused. So Paul faced this issue head 
on. He met it face to face. Paul is not one to back down from anything. We know that. And uh, he met it face to face, explaining to individuals why indeed Jesus and how was raised from the dead. I'm going to look at it from a little bit different perspective. I want to tell you about our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you about a different way of looking at the depth of who he is. And this came to me not, uh, it came to me via a, a pastor not too long ago. And that pastor talked about the fact that Jesus was called a carpenter. And yet he said the Hebrew word used for carpenter actually means architect. When we use the word architect, it adds a total new dimension of who Christ is. We know it in our hearts because we look at the heavens, we look at the stars, we look at the heavenly bodies, we look at creation, and we see his touch in all things. We look at a leaf and we see the design, the intricacy. We look at a rose, a flower of any kind, and see the architect's design in that, but we don't often think about Jesus being that magnificent architect. Listen to the words of John, the beloved. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not and will not overcome it. The word that is God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John writes, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John starts, in the beginning was the word. So we're going to go back to the beginning. As God created, and we see uh, God creating all matter of life, and then God comes to the time where he creates humankind. God says in the first creation story, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Let's make mankind in our image. I have a strange imagination. And my imagination conjures up a picture of God taking a lump of clay and wadding it up in his hands and throwing it down on the ground, on the earth, and the, the wad of clay goes splat. And God looks at it along with the Son and the Holy Spirit and says, that's not what I had in mind. It's not what God had in mind. And it's not what God did. God was infinitely involved in the creation of this earth suit that we wear. This body that houses our soul and our spirit is a body that has been created to live in this world, in this time, in this place. 
We were made, all of our nerve endings and muscles and ligaments and all of the impulses of our brain, we were made and constructed and designed by the mighty architect to live in this world. But even though God did all of that, what lay before him still had no life in it. The second creation story reads like this. Then the Lord God formed a man, formed, designed a man from the dust of the ground. And in order for that dust that has been formed and that whole, all of the intricacies of it, the amazing ways in which God put us together, the way in which that was done, we still needed what I call a God spark. Scripture says, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God breathed spirit and soul into that body that would be Adam, and Adam came to life. And so in this life, God has designed us, God has made us. Our Lord Jesus Christ has made us in all manners able to function and live and breathe in this beautiful earth that he made. And though we were never intended to be separated from him, we chose to be separated and God knew before he breathed life into us that his son was going to have to suffer and die for the sin that we would commit in our separation. The longer we stay away from God, the more we diminish. These bodies that we have, as they age and they break down, and they are consumed with time. And yet this is the beautiful, intricate creation that God gave us. David said, Lord, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God had everything to do with our making. You created my inmost being. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. David, who's had a heart for God, wrote these beautiful words reminding us that we are intricately designed by God. The most intricate thing that God did. And yet... As Paul speaks to the people of the church of Corinth and anyone else who was willing to listen, as Paul speaks, he speaks of something better. Better than this wonderful body that God gave us. Better than all the intricate design. Better because this earth where this body keeps us and we are captured in this body on this earth it's better than that because the body God's going to give us is a heavenly body without limits, no matter what. It's a heavenly body that's going to be designed again by God so that we can live in heaven's realm with him without limit. When we remember about Lazarus being raised from the dead, when Lazarus came back, he was wearing the same earth suit he, he had when he left. Bless his heart, same earth suit. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, he had a different type of body. Now, will we be like him in that body that the disciples witnessed? 
don't know, that's God's thing. He can take care of that. But we know that it will be better. It will be uh, more, uh, we will be not confined. We will have more knowledge and wisdom. We will be forever with God and forever as we are. Sigmund Freud said concerning death, he wrote, and finally, there is the pain, painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has yet been found, nor probably ever will be. Those who believe that Jesus was not raised from the dead are without hope. Paul said that if we believed in Jesus only for our earthly lives, then we are so hopeless. We are those that are without hope. And yet Paul did not stop there. Paul explained to the church that what is mortal must put on immortality. What is perishable must put on imperishability. God has plans for us. God is not leaving us without hope. God has better yet than these bodies that we function in now, and they will be forever bodies. Not an earth suit, a heavenly suit. When we plant seeds in the ground, we don't expect them to come up exactly like they went in. <coughs> Excuse me. We expect them to come up differently, but that seed that we put in the ground has to die in order to make something new. If you look at a pack of carrots, which always amazed me, and you take that little pack of carrots and open them up, <coughs> excuse me, and they have a picture on the front that looks like carrots, but you pour them into your hand, there's this little bitty pile of little bitty miniature seeds, tiny, tiny, tiny. And you look at them and think, there's carrots in there. And when they come up, they're going to look like that. So much different, so much better, fruitful, a bounty of edible Good stuff for anybody that wants to eat carrots. I love carrots. God says that we must be like a seed and give ourselves up so that we can be reborn. We are reborn here from spiritual death to spiritual life. And already in that state, in this state, we are kingdom children. And the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ that lived and died and was resurrected lives in us. Along with our Lord, our Father God, and the Spirit of God, they are in us as we are in this earthly suit but someday when we pass from here to home and when Jesus comes to take his church we will be no longer bound no longer limited but all that is perishable will put on the imperishable that is a heavenly and holy body meant for heaven. Paul gives us hope. This is the mystery, he said. 
Christ died, lived, died, and was resurrected. The focus, the pivotal point, the main foundation of who we are as Christians rests right there. May you, as you go during and through this Lenten time, remember what God has done. Your bodies are where he lives. They're his temple here. But these bodies will pass away. But that's okay, because God's got something better in our heavenly future. I pray that on this day, you receive the benediction that you know without doubt that you are loved fully and wholly by Almighty God. And I pray God's gracious and glorious shalom that you be showered in it, drenched in it, immersed in it. In Jesus' holy and gracious name, King of kings and Lord of lords, Amen.